Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nolini Jafnun. I teach at the Center for Contemporary Studies, and I will be serving as a moderator for the talk event, Disorderly Histories and Anthropology of Decolonization in Western Sahara. To discuss this topic, I am pleased to be joined here by uh, Dr. Mark Drury. So, Dr. Drury is a political anthropologist, historian of decolonization, and scholar of the Sahara. He examines how unresolved tensions between anti colonial and nationalist projects continue to shape uh, forms of political mobilization across North, North West Africa. His, transition, his, his uh, translational approach to understanding political belonging in this region has taken him to Moroccan occupied Western Sahara. Morocco, Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria and Northern uh, Mauritania. Dr. Drury has published in comparative studies in South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, and the Journal of North African Studies, among others. As a member of uh, the International Academic Observatory on Western Sahara, Dr. Drury has participated in efforts to draw attention to political conditions in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, where he has conducted ethnographic fieldwork. His commentary related to these conditions has appeared online in the Middle East Report and Jadalia. Dr. Drury holds a PhD in anthropology from the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He is currently uh, at our postdoc fellow at the Center for Contemporary Studies here at Georgetown. This evening, Dr. Drury will be looking at decolonization as a complex process that has involved over a longer set of time while involving multiple actors. He moves beyond the colonizer and colonized, uh, I would say, dichotomy and uh, the standard or linear history of Western Sahara conflict to incorporate multiple actors, including Spanish and French colonialism. Moroccan, Mauritanian, Sahrawi, and Algerian, as well as other global actors. His approach situates the political history of decolonization in Northwest Africa with an regional and transnational perspective while challenging methodological nationalism. Also, we will shed light on Sahrawi activism during the last 15 years, which has become salient mainly in the aftermath of the Intifada at the level. Uprising of independence that started in May 2005 and spread from the Ayun city to other Sahrawi places. Five years uh, later, in October 2010, um, only two months before the Tunisian protests sparked the Arab uprisings across the region, a new wave of uprising erupted in the Gdaim Zid camp, which constituted a pivotal moment in the Western Saharan nationalism. And this event brought both new mode of resistance and significant international attention, as well as further hatred Sahrawi identity. Dr. Drury will first discuss his work, and uh, I will follow up with a few questions. Then we'll open the floor to your questions. To our online audience, please ask our questions using the Zoom Q&A feature, and our event manager, Koko will direct them to me. If you have any technical issues, please email coco, C -O -C -O, dot date, T -A -I -T, at georgetown.eu. This information will also be in the chat. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Dury. I would like to thank, um, first, Professor Jibnoun for uh, that introduction and for agreeing to moderate this talk. Um, to Coco for making this all possible. Um, and really to everyone at CCAS for such a stimulating and welcoming environment. I've been to a number of talks um, in person or remotely throughout the fall, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be up here to speak in front of people um, who track through the rain. Um, so my interest, it's also really exciting to be here with people who I know know this situation very well. So I look forward to our discussion. Um, my interests, uh, broadly speaking, include, uh, as we already just mentioned, <coughs> historiography of decolonization, political and legal anthropology, and human rights in political conflict. I'm trained at the intersection of anthropology and um, history, and so methodologically I draw upon archival research, ethnographic fieldwork, as well as oral history for the material that I'll be presenting this evening. 
Um, this interdisciplinary training treats um, anthropology and history not as distinct disciplines so much as complementary approaches that um, share an overlapping interest in questions of structure and agency, social change, uh, and the experience of time. Um, I've applied this anthrohistorical anthro approach to the study of decolonization in Northwest Africa. And my research entailed uh, three separate trips to Lyon, uh, one of, and, um, the, which is the largest city in the disputed territory of Western Sahara, which I'll refer to from now on as Moroccan occupied Western Sahara. Uh, here's a map of Western Sahara. And just to note a couple times at the top, uh, there are two uh, small cities called Gulmim and Tampan. And I'll, I'll be referring to that region known as Wet Noon a couple times throughout the, throughout the talk. Um, so while I was in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, I met uh, Sahrawis and Moroccans coming from a number of different places uh, whose backgrounds reflected as well a range of political affiliations and commitments. Um, and during that time, I noticed I was also being pulled in separate temporal directions. Agents of the Moroccan state were occasionally dispatched to direct me away from the present and towards the 1950s. Um, yet during these, uh, this, this uh, field work, which involved um, pretty intense surveillance and militarized repression, um, I encountered Sahra who was willing to speak at some risk about their activism for self-determination. Um, so pulled in these two directions, towards the past and the ethnographic present, uh, I was really subject to surveillance of an intensity unlike anything I've experienced. Uh, so to cope with that, I uh, moved around. First to other cities in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, then to a region just north, Wendun, uh, then to major cities in Morocco, where I met with figures uh, familiar with different moments in this history of decolonization. Finally, after over a year in Morocco and uh, the Moroccan occupied territory, I spent eight months in Mauritania, um, where I encountered many of the same people I first met in Western Sahara, but where they could speak more freely. And finally, I spent three weeks in Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria on the map near the flag uh, marking Tindouf. In moving across space, I also maintained this interest in historical research, uh, talking to people who remembered a period of colonialism when borders were crossed so frequently that one's affiliate, affiliation was described as being registered with the French or registered with the Spanish, this attention to shifts over time in borders, identities, and territoriality, um, it kept me invested in historical research. Some of it through secondary sources, much of it through oral histories, uh, supplemented as well by archival research in Aix-en-Provence and Vincennes uh, and, and Paris. So today's talk is organized around two axes of research, the political history of decolonization in Western Sahara and human rights activism um, over the past 15 years in, in what I'll call the ethnographic present when I was there. Thematically, these two axes inform um, as well my current research and future plans, utilizing decolonization as a framework to think and write against methodological nationalism on the one hand, and examining ethnographically the constraints of, and possibilities of human rights on the other. So the research I'm discussing today comes from a book project that uses the conflict over Western Sahara as a point of departure for what I'm calling an anthropology of decolonization. And what I mean by that is an ethnography of political formations produced by projects motivated by uh, the possibility, the expectation of decolonization, that's one. An exploration of these political histories, um, specifically in Northwest Africa. And theoretically, analytically, uh, I'm, I'm interested in this uh, anthropology of decolonization serving as a critique of methodological nationalism. And here I mean uh, studies that assume and presume a national analytical framework and or national units of study. In sum, then, this is a critical re-examination of decolonization as a concept based on a particular empirically researched case. So as Nordin mentioned, uh, I'll be focusing on two moments, one more historical, the other more ethnographic. The first from the 1950s, when an armed movement known as the Moroccan Liberation Army in the Sahara, Jish Tahrir, uh, briefly occupied most of what was then a Spanish colony. Uh, the second part of the talk will focus on the last 15 years and attempts by Sahrawi nationalists uh, to draw attention to their cause through the idiom of human rights. 
The, the moment from the 1950s uh, reveals decolonization not only as a horizon of expectation for forms of political freedom, right, anti-colonial, free, uh, post-colonial freedom, but also as a border-making process that has produced a lasting disjuncture in this part of the world between people, sovereignty, and territory. I just want to note that this is not uh, a comprehensive or even a standard history of the Western Sahara conflict. I'll, for example, be, um, I won't be focusing on the moment from the 1970s, which is quite pivotal. I'd be happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, and for any math students who are taking a course with Professor Jim Noon, I think you'll be looking at that uh, conflict more comprehensively next week. Um, so part one. The Moroccan Liberation Army was an anti-colonial movement that uh, emerged in the early 1950s, but crucially did not disband when Morocco gained independence in 1956. Instead, the armed movement um, departed from the Moroccan cities and reef mountains in the north, where uh, its members had been concentrated, and moved south to this region of Wet Moon, uh, Gunim precisely, the famed gateway for trans saharan trade. So to understand that what I'll refer to as the MLA's continuation and intensification after Moroccan independence, I argue one must first rethink this independence not as the culmination or outcome of anti-colonial nationalism, but more in terms of a temporal disjuncture. So it's rethinking a common historiographical narrative of colonialism, colonialism anti-colonial nationalism, national independence as the end point. And I'll try to explain that, what I mean more specifically. In August 1955, France had set the course for ending colonial rule in Morocco following negotiations at a conference at Aix-les-Bains. And yet, months later, a shipment of arms arranged by Governor Abdel Nasser and coming via Czechoslovakia arrived on Morocco's northern Mediterranean coast to be divided between the MLA and the Algerian National Liberation Front. <clears throat> MLA, MLA leadership, which included uh, prominent anti-colonial leaders, such as the Fassi brothers and Mahdi Ben Barka, made the strategic decision then to divide this newly, freshly armed movement um, and move out of the northern part of the country to the south. Yet mere months following this armed shipment, by March 1956, uh, France had restored Mohammed VI to the Mohammed V to the throne and granted Moroccan independence. Spain, of course, ended its protectorate over northern Morocco a month later, retaining control over its colony in the Sahara. So I argue the MLA's continuation beyond Moroccan independence was the outcome of a temporal disjunct disjuncture between the abrupt end of the French protectorate in Morocco, which coincided with the intensification of armed resistance in the Moroccan countryside. But why the move to the Sahara? Here, I suggest we need uh, an imperial and regional perspective of decolonization, one, one which accounts for French interests uh, across North Africa and Sahara. In 1956, France expedited the decolonization of Tunisian and Moroccan protectorates as a means of both attenuating anti-colonial demands, but also an, as an attempt to try and consolidate its control, of course, over Algeria, which governed directly as an administrative unit of France proper. The major imperative in the MLA's turn to the Sahara then was to maintain pressure on France, to discourage the imperial power, which still had military personnel in Morocco, from using Moroccan airfields as a base from which to disrupt FLN activities in Algeria. So in continuing operations beyond and past Moroccan independence, the MLA was advancing a kind of regional anti-colonialism, one embodied in slogans used by, among others, Abdul Karim Khattabi and al Fessi during their exile, that said, so long as Algeria is not free, we will not parade in Rabat. So the sense that independence did not bring about the end of anti-colonial struggle also reflected an awareness among MLA uh, combatants that the Sahara was the site for a late imperial scramble uh, and site of capital investment. The discovery of oil in Eastern Algeria in July 1956 gave renewed impetus in the met metropole for establishing a governing apparatus that would enable France to maintain ongoing ties for capital investment to the region. This apparatus, known as uh, l'Organisation Commune de la Région Saharienne, which I'll refer to by its French acronym, OCRS, was established by the French National Assembly in January 1957, so less than a year after Moroccan independence. This kind of federated alternative to empire project 
uh, was uh, meant to take hybrid form almost as a kind of deterritorialized neo-colonial enterprise zone um, and a new government bureau or region. Uh, again, it which was meant to allow decolonized countries, and you see in this map, uh, those would be Mali, Niger, Chad, to quote, opt in to a shared economic framework that of course would reproduce the monopoly relations with, with the metropole. Uh, this was more uh, aspirational than ever fully realized, but the department was, uh, was formed and there were a great deal of discussions in, in French uh, imperial government around uh, its establishment. And I draw attention to this because French attempts to form OCRS in order to retain access to Saharan resources, even as decolonization appeared imminent, contributed to changes in the border regime between French Algeria and Morocco, which took on new and increasingly unfamiliar definition. Despite Morocco's sudden independence then, from a regional perspective, there was still an expectation among MLA combatants for ongoing struggle around broader aims of regional decolonization. And this created the conditions for a particularly liminal form of struggle uh, that I'm referring to as anti-colonial irredentism, right? The idea of anti-colonial struggle, but one that did not respect the inherited boundaries uh, of the post-colonial nation state. So a more military history of the MLA would focus on what I'm about to um, summarize uh, pretty drastically, which is that uh, the MLA carried out attacks on outposts in, across French Algeria, Northern Mauritania, and eventually Spanish Sahara. Though they were initially repelled from Northern Mauritania in the summer and fall of uh, 1957, um, the movement succeeded remarkably in occupying the vast majority of the Spanish colony. Um, this success, however, and this map shows uh, MLA regiments in the areas they controlled. This success, however, was fleeting. In early 1958, Spain and France carried out a joint counterinsurgency known as Operation Ecouvion, refers to the brush that would clean out the barrel of a gun. Um, this was a fairly remarkable operation in its own right. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sort of glossing over a lot of the details. I'd be happy to talk in more detail if there are any questions after, the, after, after my presentation. Um, but what I'd like to focus on is um, less the MLA's fleeting success and its lasting ramifications. Um, it suggests, its significance, I suggest, lie in the fact of um, the continuity of anti-colonial uh, politics beyond Moroccan independence. Uh, it's uh, irredentism, this, the fact that this operation carried out did not respect borders, essentially, right? Um, and the third dynamic concerns the armed movement's uh, composition. Although it was founded and led by Moroccans, and at least one Algerian, once the armed movement set up headquarters in Wet Noon, it succeeded in mobilizing Saharans living across the region to join. Its aims, whether articulated in terms of jihad, sultan, or Wakan nation, were broadly anti-colonial and led Saharans to volunteer uh, or perhaps be conscripted individually in kinship groups and even en masse as tribal subfractions. Many of those uh, Saharans joining the fight brought with them uh, the arms, the livestock, and other provisions that were integral to semi-nomadic pastoral living in the desert, as this um, sort of receipt uh, acknowledges that uh, when uh, Yahdi bin Bahi um, provided, donated 20 head of sheep to the MLA, uh, received uh, proof of that from the high command. Um, as an illustration of this, I'd like to focus on one individual combatant's trajectory. Mohamed was a soldier under Spanish rule in 1957 when an MLA contingent arrived and commanded his group to surrender. He then spent the next year fighting for the Liberation Army. Yeah, after the, it was routed by uh, this Operation Ecouvion, Mohamed uh, and his unit spent 20 days traveling up north on foot uh, to this region of Wet Noon. There they were based for some time until the Moroccan Royal Armed Forces, a different army, sought to conscript him. At that point, Mohamed and, and hundreds of others fled, um, decamped to French Algeria, some back to Spanish Sahara. By 1960, Mohamed was a soldier in the Mauritanian army, attending independence ceremonies in Nouakchott. Um, but since joining Sahrawi Polisario Front in the 1970s, he's lived in the refugee camps in Algeria, which is where I interviewed him. 
So by including Mohammed's itinerary, I suggest that the rise and fall of the MLA foregrounds a distinctly Saharan perspective of the process of decolonization, and in particular, two defining features. One, the re hardening, reshaping, and contestation of borders across the region, and the other, a concentrated and intensified efforts to fix and define the political affiliations of people living throughout the region. Again, those for whom borders for much of colonialism had been a matter of inconvenience, maybe. <clears throat> Both of these features highlight the complex relations of autonomy and dependence between Saharan and Maghrebi people um, that do not necessarily conform neatly to national, let alone ethnic lines, but which have clearly been transformed by lasting processes of decolonization across the region. And as an illustration of this last point, these complex relations between uh, Saharan and Maghrebi peoples, um, in the course of recounting his experience with the MLA, Mohamed conveyed a sense of having been manipulated, deceived, um, and he said, he said, they tricked us, okay? And this is a prominent theme, uh, both to Hamid's and to a number of other interlocutors' accounts of their involvement in the MLA. So more than nationalist, ethnic, tribal, or even other axes of identity, the dynamics that char characterize the experience of participating in the MLA for many Saharans revolve around a sense that they were manipulated, deceived, instrumentalized, and duped. Fractures and schisms within the armed movement, which are, are numerous, um, including distrust by the Saharan combatants towards the largely Moroccan leadership, the MLA, have had lasting effects well beyond the 1950s and into today. So why do I give so much attention to a fleeting and fairly obscure armed movement from the 1950s in Sahara? Because I argue the MLA surfaces the complexity of political formations across Northwest Africa, as well as the necessity of looking at these formations on a regional scale. Yet this history also only becomes legible when one looks beyond the historiography of the nation state. Indeed, the MLA sits in um, disjunctive relation to multiple national histories uh, within the Maghreb, uh, while remaining recorded only at the margins of French and Spanish imperial archives. It remains what Ernst Bloch calls an unsettled past one that remains alien to the synchronism, the time space of nationalist historiography. But this doesn't mean that efforts haven't been made to tame this history. The Moroccan state, for example, has developed an administrative apparatus, the High Commission on the Liberation Army and former members of the resistance, devoted to recognizing and amplifying the MLA's history through publications, museums, and events. And this is one example of, of, a, of a commemorative publication. Uh, by the, uh, the High Commission's uh, publishing way. Yet this historiography that what it publishes remains very much subject to Moroccan state security prerogatives. So there are things that can't be said. Um, and this is why I, I say this is more of an uh, unsettled past, more than simply a silenced past, because even these publications keep producing new controversies. Um, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, uh, Sadr, meanwhile, often seeks to downplay this moment, uh, sometimes even erasing it from Sahrawi nationalist narratives, which focus on the emergence of a Sahrawi national movement in the 1970s. <clears throat> and here's a panel from a national museum, Sadr's National Museum in the refugee camps in Algeria, that um, describes the destruction uh, wrought by al a massive population displacement, um, killing livestock and poisoning wells. Um, but there's no mention actually of the Moroccan Liberation Army in this entry on, on the uh, sort of national timeline. More broadly, uh, literature on, on North Africa has contributed significantly to broadening the histori historiographical scope and conceptual understanding of what constitutes decolonization. However, many of these studies still end at the threshold of national independence. Um, moreover, much of this recent literature uh, revisiting the significance of decolonization tends to focus on intellectual history um, or elite politics. My work here, by contrast, focuses on what uh, Omnia Ashakri has referred to as the minor literatures or the textured local debates of decolonization and traces the ramifications of these local debates across time, space, and scale. Um, there are clear um, gaps in this history and many questions that remain unanswered to say nothing about everything that I sort of glossed over. I still suggest that paying attention to this quote unquote minor literature in North Africa and SARS decolonization 
can draw our attention to the profound impact that this episode has had on the region. And that, it, and that attention to these textured local debates um, surrounding such an episode should help us to understand its, its lasting ramifications to the present. And finally, uh, I'm repeating myself at this point, but foregrounding a process of decolonization uh, that defies methodological nationalism brings, I think, a distinctly Saharan perspective uh, of this process into high relief. A heartening and reshaping of borders on the one hand, and concentrated efforts to fix and define the political affiliations of people living throughout uh, the, the, the Western Sahara. So as I'm shifting gears, I, I put a very basic timeline productive in its own way uh, that notes sort of marks um, Two, two moments that I'll be, I'll be passing over in 1975, when Morocco invaded the Saharan colony um, and, and the nationalist conflict properly uh, started. And, and 1991, when the UN broke a ceasefire, drop, um, the first phase of our conflict to that. So the first half of the talk, I, I discussed the kind of liminal space uh, of the Moroccan Liberation Army in the Sahara, an anti-colonial movement carrying out attacks after Morocco had gained independence uh, and a movement that refused to accept received post-colonial borders, what I call anti-colonial irredentism. The second part of the talk um, draws upon fieldwork conducted in Moroccan-occupied Western Sahara, Morocco, Mauritania, and Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria to show how uh, decolon this process of unresolved decolonization has produced forms of mm, political mobilization that reflect a kind of strandedness within and by the process of decolonization. Yet in moving to a more recent period, this liminality continues to apply. Um, one could argue that uh, Sahrawis living in, in, in the camps as well as Moroccan occupied Western Sahara um, continue to live in, in a state uh, of liminality um, between decolonization and national sovereignty, um, between war and peace, between occupation and, and international recognition and between conflict and resolution. And, and particularly since the UN brokered ceasefire of 1991, this has been a kind of restless living in the meantime of waiting for decolonization and conflict resolution to come to an end. So since 1975, when Morocco invaded Western Sahara preempting Sahrawi self-determination under Spanish colonialism, Morocco has effectively occupied most of the territory. The Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, uh, Sadr, based in refugee camps in Algeria since that time, has been recognized by as many as 84 UN member states, although that number is uh, present down to several dozen. As the recognized representative of the Sahrawi people before the UN, Sadr organizes petitioners presenting Western Sahara's case before the UN General Assembly, UN Commission on, High, on Human Rights, the Special Political and Decolonization Commission, while also participating in multilateral organizations, including the African Union. Both Morocco and Sadr are institutionally entrenched in the global order of nation states in different ways. And so I, this situation might be characterized as one of being kind of stranded, living under two regimes in decolonization. Despite this fact, Sahrawi seeking self-determination remain remarkably active politically. So this part of the talk explores developments through the subjective experience of Sahrawi activists living in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, with particular attention to someone I'll, I'll call Moulay. Moulay is a Sahrawi monadid or militant who lives in Moroccan occupied territory and supports Sahrawi self-determination. As such, he has faced relentless state repression and intimidation. Um, and in this part of the talk, I'll examine Moulay's commitment to political activism under such adverse conditions with particular attention to the sort of temporal experience of what the political anthropologist Sean Lazar has called attritional time. In doing so, I ask, how do political partisans contend with life in a conflict that seems to demand their constant mobilization? What is the social experience of a political future that appears perpetually imminent, but remains chronically unattained? It's this particular mode of being stranded that I take up in the remainder of this talk. So to date, the most lasting period of the Western Sahara conflict, longer than, than the armed conflict in the 80s, longer than the UN-led efforts to hold a referendum in the 90s, <clears throat> emerged from a popular uprising among Sahrawis living in Moroccan-occupied Western Sahara. 
Building upon a burgeoning human rights discourse in Morocco during the 90s, Sahrawis living under Moroccan control began organizing under nonviolent organizing nonviolent demonstrations in Western Sahara cities. Beginning in 2006, nonviolent protests in this territory took a more organized form through the initiative of a student-led intifada, when Sahrawi students began demonstrating against the presence of Moroccan security agents in their schools. This massive uprising coordinated across uh, the territory, including Sahrawis living in Wendun, adjacent to the disputed territory, initiated a sustained effort to make Moroccan illegitimacy in the territory visible through ongoing nonviolent protest. Known as Intifada de Istiklal, the Independence Intifada, the uprising established nonviolent civil disobedience as a central political tactic, while also indoctrinating a new generation of Sahrawis into political activism. A woman who participated in the uprising and who has remained an activist in Moroccan occupied territory described the influence of this uprising on her generation. As she said, with the children who were born after the ceasefire, the Intifada made things clear for them. They began asking about this issue that we have. Um, I was born in the year of the Sahara, and I began asking, inquiring, discovered that I had martyrs in my family, people who died, people who had been killed, people who were kidnapped. Before then, I wasn't aware of the issue, didn't know what my family had gone through about during the war. I hadn't known that half my family was in refugee camps or that they'd been subject to difficulties in life during that time and kidnapping. So this activist mentioned, um, having been animated by the emergence of human rights as a terrain of struggle within the conflict over the past 15 years, nonviolent resistance has become an important tactic in the broader conflict. And increasingly, activism within Morocco occupied Western Sahara has turned on this urban nexus of rights based protest and state repression at the center of a conflict hinging on international recognition of sovereignty. And for reasons of demography and size, Layoun has been very much at the center of these struggles. The resulting tension is palpable enough in Layoun, <coughs> residents sometimes refer to the city in dark, even foreboding terms the belly of the beast or the mouth of the volcano. Sahrawi activists have compared it to being trapped inside a box wrapped in darkness, a very such that no one can see in from the outside. And even Moroccan officials have complained that being assigned there is a component punishment despite a wage bonus that uh, at the time of my field work was reportedly 50% for public functionaries. As I found during ethnographic field work in Ayoun and throughout Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, um, committed nationalist activism animates the lives of many Sahrawis, often at considerable risk of arrest, arrest and, and physical abuse. Protests often take place with someone videotaping from a nearby rooftop or apartment window. Footage taped in this clandestine manner is then delivered to and broadcast from the Sadr run refugee camps in Algeria, keeping sympathetic viewers in Moroccan occupied territory informed of protests that in some cases may have taken place less than 100 yards from the viewer's apartment. While this loop serves to engage and reproduce committed publics within the local political geography of conflict, gaining international attention remains the ever-present and elusive goal. So establishing research contact with the Sahrawi activists in Morocco um, was not easy. Um, unlike researchers and journalists who embedded themselves in the Sahrawi activist network, I registered with Moroccan authorities. Uh, this approach enabled me to grasp the complex range of political identified uh, identities that often defied the polarized terms of nationalist conflict. Um, or at least that's what I told myself to justify this, this choice. But I quickly learned that the Moroccan state would also deploy significant resources to make uh, uh, Sahrawi activists off limits or seem off limits to researchers and journalists. In other words, my interactions with these activists often required significant planning, generally took place in private residences. Um, and were limited in time. Nonetheless, during my field work in Laayoune in, in, in 2014, human rights protests had reached a, a fever pitch. The city was enveloped by protest, um, sort of roiling with the possibility of, of change. That spring, one of the most prominent uh, Sahrawi activists, Zemin Abtu Haydar, had, had an audience with the US Congress as part of a movement-based diplomacy effort to build support for expanding uh, the mandate for the UN peacekeeping mission in Western Sahara to include human rights oversight. 
Sahrawis in Layoun were celebrating their every move online while trying to maintain pressure on, on UN bodies responsible for this decision, um, largely through, through protest that seemed to be taking place every day. Um, given the difficulty of meeting with these activists who were actively involved in the protests, I was thrilled to get to know Moulet. He was also happy to talk about his experiences. Having participated in several protests involving this nonviolent civil disobedience, Moulet noted how much he looked forward to them. He felt a nervous anticipation ahead of the confrontations, he told me, which he encountered by engaging in a kind of preparatory regimen, laying out what he would wear in advance, visualizing how the protests might play out, and so on. These preparations culminated in the protest itself, which he said took place in a reassuringly predictable fashion. You show up at the appointed time, take your beating, come home feeling better for it. With regard to the physical exertion involved, he noted that with a broad smile that participating in the week weekly demonstration was had a match at, uh, like playing in a soccer match. When Moulet compares his participation to the protests to match at, he, ca he casts this repetition I think in both ritualistic and uh, surprisingly to me, even recreational terms. Whereas many political de demonstrations in Layoun were, were spontaneous and their outcome was very much unknown, it could be very violent. The relatively high profile protests in which my Moulet was taking part occurred weekly at the same time and place, providing a cyclical sense of temporality like any regular scheduled appointment. This repetition, I think, inscribed Moulet's sense of commitment and involvement in the community of, of Sahrawi political activism into a temporality of continuous struggle, one that with every protest reinstantiated a horizon of expectation for change and motivated, therefore, future political action. Repetition in this way provided the platform for Malay to reenact his political commitment as a militant and activist through physical sacrifice and even a kind of moral purification. And yet his analogy to soccer match characteristic of his sort of lighthearted conviction, seemed to deliberately downplay the stakes, emphasizing the voluntaristic side of his activism. Which I found kind of remarkable. As I mentioned earlier, um, Sean Lazar, as a, a political anthropologist, describes a traditional time as, quote, one of constant protest or negotiation, the continuance of the day-to-day -day of political life when there is no resolution in sight. This characterization of the temporality of activism implies continuity and repetition, both of which emerge from Moulet's description of his regular participation in civil disobedience. The distinction for Moulet and other Sahrawi activists was that some resolution appeared imminent and continuously so, and yet uh, this helped to reinscribe his regular participation in, in protest in the temporal structure, structure of strandedness, which I referred to earlier. They're, they're motivated because the um, certain political goals continuously appeared to be imminent, yet were constantly deferred. The generation of students that came of age during Intifada um, Tarkistan became also politicized at a relatively young age. And many, including Moulet, uh, remained active politically for years, if not decades. For them, the day-to-day -day developments of the cause for self-determination unfold upon a dense emotional terrain. This is because the dangers that they face in the form of a security state intent upon destroying their political will are many. This includes the potential for physical injuries and suffered during protests. I interviewed one man with his arm in a sling, which was the direct result of an injury suffered while protesting. The Sahrawi activist Sultan Khaya famously lost her eye when security forces descended <laughs> upon her during the protest. Likewise, I had heard from activists who had uh, experienced various forms of torture and brutality, including sexual assault, while in Moroccan prisons. On one occasion, when by chance I ran into a, a, an activist in the open air market of Layoun, his hesitation and the fact that he quickly looked away after our eyes had met um, clearly indicated his fear of being seen in the act of acknowledging my presence. This overarching sensitivity to the uh, constant presence of, of, of security personnel uh, brought to mind the embodied dis disposition of almost fugitivity. Um, one interlocutor put it, interpreted all of this somewhat pessimistically when taking stock of the cumulative effects uh, of a generation on a generation of activists when he said, politics ruin the minds of the young. 
So in this way, uh, this man was expressing a kind of sympathy even for the effects of living through the volatile ups and downs, gains and losses, moral outrages and righteous victories that characterize close engagement with the political cause of self-determination over a period of time. Yet many Sahrawis like Aminatou Haydar, Sultan Khaya and Mule, who joined the cause early on remain, have remained active and involved for, for decades. From this perspective, attritional time um, can be deployed through activism to sustain a cause through repetition and renewed commitment. The Sahrawi context shows that this attritional time still unfolds upon a terrain of danger and fear, as well as hope, moral outrage, and disillusionment, threatening to wear activists down through the experience of this relentless temporality. Whether in the form of a broken arm or a compromised spirit, the varied effects of this attritional time can be seen in injured bodies, but also uh, in activities believed to compensate for trauma, injury, torture, or simply deep disillusionment. So while many have remained res uh, resolutely uh, committed to continued activism about, despite these many dangers, um, the sustained political struggle has worn some activists down. As I learned during my time there, activism for Sahrawi self-determination in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara no doubt subjects the mind and body to relentless attacks by the blunt instruments of fear and surveillance deployed by the Moroccan state. The last aspect uh, I'd like to focus on in terms of this temporal experience of sustained activism, um, I learned at a, during the month of May, which brings about sort of two of the most significant hol holidays for Sahrawi nationalists, the founding of the anti-colonial movement, the uh, Polisario Front, 10, May 10, 1973, and its de declaration of armed struggle for independence 10 days later. Supporters uh, living in Morocco uh, and Moroccan occupied territory commemorate these events inside their homes through private gatherings that often involve consuming the, the television and radio programs broadcast from the refugee camps. The dates are also often marked by public demonstrations, which invariably entail confrontation with state security apparatus. And uh, in 2014, when I was there, uh, the, the unresolved campaign for human rights oversight combined with these nationalist holidays meant that tensions were very high. In this context, I caught up with Moule uh, at a cafe near where we both lived. And although the intensity of the protests in which he was participating had begun to taper off, the political foment that had animated the spring still hadn't subsided. Moulet told me he'd recently attended two events, one a memorial service and the other a human rights training session supported by an EU-based organization. Both were held in private and um, both of course had attracted a heavy uh, police presence surrounding the perimeter where they were held. Yet Moulet reported that uh, both events took place undeterred, without major interruption or confrontation with uh, state security forces. So for him, he argued that in the past, similar events would have been raided, blockaded, even broken up. And so he claimed that the poss possibility of even holding these events should be considered a kind of muktasavat or gain um, made through political activism and struggle. This statement struck me initially as overly optimistic and even a, a reflection of Moulet's positive outlook. But describing these, uh, these events in terms of gains, Moulet well, situated them in, in relation to a longer history of activism and struggle. In contrast to the temporality of cyclical repetition and renewal expressed through his comparison of political protest to a soccer match, here gatherings of different kinds mark gains, turning political events, however mundane, into measurements of progress or setback over time. So, in the post-colonial era, efforts to establish an independent nation state have often depended upon international recognition as much as uh, relations of force. And um, this tension in sovereignty being split between group occupation and legal recognition has been noted by a number of political theorists. But in the post-World War II process of decolonization, uh, this contradiction has been particularly extended and entrenched in the post-colonial nation state. Some political scientists have sort of labeled this form of sovereignty negative sovereignty, one which is subject to international intervention. The post-colonial theorist David Scott refers to this uh, 
compromised sovereignty, post-colonial sovereignty, uh, and its aftermaths in temporal terms as, as a kind of being stranded in the post-colonial present, having achieved a goal and uh, finding it lacking and this is having dissipated. Western's hard self-determination is in many ways the inverse of this condition described by Scott. Nationalists continue to seek nation state sovereignty, however compromised, because they're simultaneously included in and excluded from the process of decolonization. Every year, the UN Special Committee on Decolonization convenes to consider the question. Um, the, the, the right to self-determination has been validated by the International Court of Justice. The Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic is you know, recognized by, partially by a number of states. And yet Sahrawis op continue to operate either in exile, diaspora, or under Moroccan occupation. And so in doing so, they operate very much at the nexus of this form of sovereignty that's been disaggregated between territorial control and international recognition. And in that sense, um, they've been both stranded both by and in decolonization. In focusing on this as a temporal experience, this section of the paper is presented as kind of ethnographic description and account of strandedness that's not defined by the evacuation of horizons of possibility as David Scott has framed it, but by prolonged engagement in political action for the sake of a goal that remains continuously imminent, yet uh, constantly unattained. By focusing on this temporal experience of strandedness, I've also drawn attention to the complex relationship between um, time, political action, and political subjectivity for activists in, in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara. And speaking at a moment in conclusion uh, of kind of great uh, difficulty for these activists, um, and perhaps drawing in part upon Moulet's resolve, uh, this attritional temporality of their movement politics may still work in their favor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. This is, uh, um, I would say, the most compelling presentation that I ever attended on the subject. Um, uh, I am really um, impressed by uh, your uh, perspective on the minor literature, uh, especially the local debate on decolonization in the context of Northwest Africa. And uh, of course, the uh, how you try to bring the uh, untold stories or narratives and mainly the voiceless of the civil term uh, in that context. And that uh, not well known, the instrumental role of the MLA in this process of decolonization. Uh, that being said, I have uh, few questions. So uh, you talked about the 70s, and if you could like uh, talk more about how the conflict over uh, Western Sahara um, involved, uh, I would say, unfolded and shaped in the mid 70s after Spain announced its plan uh, to decolonize uh, the Spanish Sahara, while the Moroccan government, of course, demanded an opinion from the International Court of Justice at that time. Um, on Morocco's historical claims over the territory that uh, was issued by the uh, International Court of Justice, I think on October 16, 1979, uh, 75. Uh, and later King Hassan II uh, used that um, means opinion coming from the uh, ICG to launch his uh, Green March. So uh, if you can, talk or further elaborate on about about that time which i think was very critical to uh, the sure. invasion and the occupation of of of, of western sahara yeah. now um thank you for the comments and that question um i think one of the main points of, uh, about i mean this is kind of like a key moment a transformative moment in the history of of, of the region um that that in a sense ushered in the conflict as it exists today. Uh, and um, you know, one of the key points is that um, the, the Green March, so-called by uh, Hassan II, was, was promoted 
to his own people as a as an almost peaceful um, you know intervention and a kind of uh, diplomatic coup, and yet uh, it was preceded by an actual military invasion. And I think it's that is important to to note primarily, as a number of uh, you know, political scientists have. I've also sort of looked at um, the political landscape leading up to that moment, um, which involved a whole constellation of movements. Um, the, the Polisario Front, which uh, formed in 1973, um, was animated. The, the, the question of the future of Western Sahara uh, really animated and mobilized um, leftist groups across the region. Um, including um, new left movements in Morocco, uh, Ila Amam, and, and to a lesser extent, the March, March 23rd movement. Um, the Polisario Front uh, grew and developed uh, alongside um, something known as the Kadhaim movement in, in Mauritania. And um, Gaddafi was also involved with, yeah. with operatives. Uh, and so it, 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 part of why I, I return often to this regional perspective is to note how it's 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 constantly um, entangled in a regional in a regional way uh, but also to note that in that in that period um, which was one of it intensifying repression of leftists within Morocco and of any dissidents uh, the Sahara was seen by some of these movements movements as a kind of key to unlocking an anti-imperialist um, uh, which is an interesting concept, this, uh, this notion of the Sahara as almost as a revolutionary subject. Um, yeah. And which goes back to your question in 1975, that all was, was foreclosed with the invasion. Yeah. One last question. <laughs> yeah, I can ask a question. So like, uh, uh, who is like Sahrawi, and what is like the relationship between like uh, Sahrawi, uh, Sahrawi and Western Sahara, and like Sahrawi and Assazag or Rumi? Assazag and Rumi, like. It's a great question. Okay. Um, and, a, and a very anthropological one, too. <laughs> Right, so I mean, we can talk about identity not as fixed, as historically contingent, as deeply complex, uh, multiple and layered. Um, this is my anthropological answer to your anthropological <laughs> question. Uh, um, and the question was Sahrawi. Often when I write, I don't know if this is kind of like overly historical fussiness, you know, you can tell me, but if I'm referring to Saharan, people before the 60s, I, I try to refer to them as Sahara, because Sahrawi as an identity, as a political identity, uh, began, with, uh, as I understand it, with the Haraka Jeniniya in, in, in 1970, and then the, the Polisari Front, right? And so that identity was, of course, then layered on top of uh, uh, tribal identities, uh, Beylani identity, uh, which itself is a complex, uh, identity that is, uh, um, and this Beidani as an identity is both racialized and uh, uh, relational, not in a nationalist way, manner, but uh, defined in terms of a kind of Arabness and in contradistinction to um, the Shilha, right, Tamazight on the one hand, and uh, Le Quart, uh Blacks on the other, right? Uh, or, or, or we could say non-Arab Blacks, I should say, right? Um, and in, uh, I go on and on about this, but what the Sahrawi identity uh, did among other things was as nationalist identity does, is have a leveling effect, um, as well as create certain boundaries that didn't exist before. But your question bothered about um, its relationship to Wed Noon, uh, I don't think there's a clear, a clear boundary there. And part of what makes Layoun a particular city is that um, in the 90s, Morocco organized uh, a lot of a lot of Sahrawis from Wednoun uh, to move to La to Layoun. 
right, under the expectation that they would vote for Morocco in the referendum. And um, so, uh, and not all, and, and yet many of those identities shifted in, and turned, right. Um, but it makes Layoun a particularly complex and complicated uh, uh, a city for that reason. So all of the cities in, in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara have a lot of Moroccans who've been induced uh, to come to the territory. Um, Sahara is referred to them as Dakhilis from inside. Right? But uh, these Sahrawis from Wednu, uh, some of them, the families had been part of the Moroccan Liberation Army and they fled north after this Spanish-French counterinsurgency and then had only been living in Wed Nun permanently, let's say, for a generation or so. And so coming to Layoun in the 90s constituted perhaps a kind of return. If I may follow up on identity. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I just to follow up, like what are the implications for like, uh, what is it, referendum? Like for this issue, so like the implications for like the relationship between Southern Saharans and Western Saharans. There are many different levels to that question. I think one was a, a kind of bureaucratic question for the UN about uh, who um, counts and who should be counted and who gets to vote. And this was uh, attempted to be determined by um, tribal subfraction. But uh, uh, as I understand both sides, there was a great deal of negotiation throughout the 90s over um, how wide to expand the definition and how, and how narrow to keep it. And then on top of that, uh, Morocco was frequently trying to corrupt the process by, by um, again, bringing people from in Morocco to um, essentially uh, you know, claim to be Sahrawi and kind of flood the, you know, the referendum voting rolls. Uh, on another level, I found uh, in my field work that there was there, there were some who, who, who drew a, a strong distinction between those who came from Wednun, who tended to belong to a set of a tribal confederation known as Tekna, more frequently than, than uh, uh, Ardigibat or, or Helbert Allah or others, right? Um, but then there were many others who don't see the distinction. Because of course these kinship groups have also been Ulad uh, Busba or one who are historically been distributed widely throughout the region. Thanks, Mark. That was really interesting. Um, and forgive my ignorance too, because I don't really know like the details of some of what you were talking about. So you talked. So I have like a specific question about details, and then a methodological question. But you talked about um, the like the most recent the independence intifada and kind of an explicit um, strategy of using nonviolence. And I was just interested to hear more about kind of like who makes that decision and who polices that decision and, and why this was chosen as a strategy. Um, so that's my first question. So I'll start with that. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I'm not sure I have a, a clear answer, but I think there were. Um, Sahrawis who were involved in the Mor Moroccan process of, um, you know, transitional just justice, um, uh, l'instance d'équité et vérité, right, uh, and were very disillusioned by that, knowing that there was not going to be actual the truth kind of disclosure, um, and so out of that involvement in human rights movements in Morocco. Uh, merged, you know, on or there were continued human rights uh, or maybe more formalized human rights groups that came out of that process. Um, and I realized the state, Moroccan state, was not going to acknowledge what had happened, uh, that new means uh, or new ways needed to be used to draw attention to these, um, to this repression, these violations. Um, and so, you know, I believe there are a number of different uh, uh, groups. One is a, the um, a group for the former victims of Moroccan, uh, you know, human rights violations in the Sahara. Uh, and these members and groups, I think, formalized uh, the sort of human rights civil society that would not conform to Moroccan state constriction, constraints. Um, strategically, and I don't really know the answer to this, 
um, who was responsible, but the, the camps in Algeria have often welcomed researchers, uh, journalists to draw attention to their cause. Um, but uh, by initiating more frequent protests in um, Moroccan occupied territory, it sort of created an, a new sort of uh, forum and audience. Um, and one that wasn't, um, that could make their own decisions, right? Because uh, Sadr is in, in some ways in, in conversation with Algeria and has to be subject to certain decision-making constraints there. Whereas members of civil society in, in Moroccan occupied Western Sahara, maybe less so. Um, and so is the choice of this strategy because of who their audience is or because of just like, because of the nature of repression. I'm, I'm just I'm just curious about like the choice of nonviolence. Because you said it was like a pretty explicit kind of unified, right? Yeah. Position. And I'm just wondering if there's what's the rationale for it? Well, I think some of it is a kind of it is a kind of audience that seeks a certain yeah. transnational witnessing public. Yeah. And and the, and a nonviolent uh, practice is one that you know could succeed. Uh, in ways that uh, violent tactics might not. Um, yeah, and you started to answer my second question, which was, I was thinking about kind of access. I just wanted to ask about access and risk and because I, yeah, and we've talked a little bit about this, but I wonder if you could, so you said that there was kind of a welcoming of researchers in the camps. So I'm just wondering in, in terms of like your interlocutors in occupied Western Sahara, yeah. Given the risks you've described, can you say just, just say something about your ability to access folks and their willingness to talk to you? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And uh, when I was there, so I'm not certainly not the only person who's gone there by any stretch of the yeah. imagination, you know, for a researcher. Um, but at the time when I was there, and, and, and others were there too, um, the. Moroccan state was actively kind of expelling they determined activists or journalists, dozens, um, and they continued to do so. Um, what, I, what I did was uh, not conducive to ethnographic research really in any way. Um, the, I, in many ways, didn't even get to speak with the activists I, I described here, aside from Moulet. Uh, really until the end, right? Because I was constantly being told, don't go to Haimu you know, just stay away from there. Uh, sorry, I'm just gonna give you kind of scattered no, memories no, because it, it did deeply affect me, but I, I, one day I tried to go to one of these regular scheduled protests. And, um, you know, there's these big metal vans, great sheathed in, in protective grading. And one went past me, it was a busy time of the day. Uh, and then a few minutes later, I, 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 was, I looked up and there was a plain clothes security. Officer said, where are you going? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, oh, uh, to the supermarket. So he said, oh, go there. You know, and so that was, I was preempted in that attempt. So um, I was in that, whether I internalized those constraints or not, you know, I, um, I did not see a, a, a planned protest. I saw rock throwing and protests yeah. on the street in front of my apartment. Um, but it also meant um, the kind of methodological constraints uh, for people who entered uh, through activist networks were inverted for me in the sense that um, I knew I was being watched. So I walked where I felt permitted, where I could go. Um, and the stories that circulated publicly, including, you know, histories and place names about the city, um, I could access that way, right? Um, and so I have a, a, another article about Layoun as a, and the kind of ethnographic history of the city based on vernacular place names that I learned from wandering around um, while being surveilled. Thank you. Yes. Good uh, yeah, this is from the online audience. Uh, thank you for this nice presentation on a sensitive topic, crisis. <clears throat> topic slash crisis in that part of the world. <clears throat> My question is about the Sahrawi women activists. Were you able to interview them about their struggle? 
Oh yeah, well the second part of the talk was based on 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 interviews, um, which you know it should be distinguished from what anthropologists call you know participant observation in the sense that it was not uh, I was not freely able to just spend uh, open ended time with 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 these interlocutors. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was it was done in weird ways. Someone would show up in a car and say, "I'll take you, I'll take you there." <laughs> um, and this would be at one time sort of outside the city, another time, um, you know, in a building with the shades drawn, sort of more in the outskirts where we could, I could, I had a longer conversation with a, with a group. Um, and that again came towards the end of, of my research. Um, whereas what I ended up doing as actual participant observation in the more traditional sense of, of how anthropologists understand it was to spend time um, with uh, Sahrawis, uh, Dakhiris, um, another group that are known as the Aideen returnees who come from the camps to, um, to quote, return to Morocco. Um, and in a sense, what that provided was a picture to the, the complex ways in which um, this political conflict has involved the struggle over um, moving people, inducing movement, right? We think of many borders uh, and political struggles today over deportation, keeping people out. In this conflict, it's often about attracting and people, uh, you know, groups of people to um, settle. And, and Layoun is essentially a, set, a, a city of um, sometimes forced displacement. Oh, yeah, there's one more from the online audience for now. Uh, how would you summarize the contemporary Moroccan's view or principal views of the Sahrawi question? That is, how does current Moroccan society view the question? Well, um, I think one thing that's striking, and I should say it's been a couple years now since I've, since I've been back with the pandemic especially, but uh, uh, the, the, the kind of hegemony um, over around the Sahara question is is fairly complete, you know. Um, in doing research, uh, one uses entirely distinct uh, terms and phrases to describe the area for uh, whether I'm talking to whether I was talking to Moroccans or, or Sahrawis. Um, and the anthropologist uh, Amelia Spadola has a good article about this as a kind of the the sort of um, mass media. Um, inflected um, Green March mobilized, you know, huge numbers of Moroccans um, and was a kind of cathexis, if you will, I guess, you know, attachment um, to, to, to their king uh, in a moment when been facing uh, you know, multiple coup d'etat. Uh, it's un the reasons for that have a lot to do, again, with, with, um, state effects, the power of the state, I think, to um, um, produce consent and certain understandings of spatial belonging of nationhood. Um, so you, 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 it is, there's a tremendous amount of effort expended to, to sort of show only the map of the unit, the map of, of, of Morocco with an unbroken that includes the, the Saharan territory. Um, one of my first mentors in Morocco, you know, showed me a, an, an atlas that he had brought back in the 1980s from abroad, where customs had simply clipped out the uh, independent territory of Western Sahara from that page. Which is ironic because it just shows the negative space of the territory. But um, it's uh, it's the 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 sense uh, there's very little dissent, and that goes back again to the 70s when. Um, movements like Il al-Amam were, were crushed, right? Uh, and one of the, which was, was one, maybe one of the few political movements that actively supported Sahrawi self-determination. Um, and they were imprisoned for lengthy periods of time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 <clears throat> it's you know, Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> 
So my question, I have two questions and more on the historical side, as you can expect. Uh, so what I understood from you, and excuse my ignorance as well, because I have little information on the history of that uh, part of the of North Africa. So you mentioned that the MLA started from the north and then they relocated down. So what is the composition of the MLA? Like, were they soldiers? Because to follow up on your question on identity, it seems to me that the struggle was not won by their, the result was not won by their struggle, right? That's what I understood from you. Like the independence of Morocco was not the uh, direct results of the MLA fighting the French, let's put it like this. It is more a diplomatic, is that, is my understanding correct? Of how Morocco won independence? Yes, right, so it is not, like, what I understood from you is that it is not direct outcome of the military struggle of or, or the fighting of the MLA, right? Or not? They they, met, they played they played a role for sure. Uh, members um, would carry out you know assassinations of, of uh, French colonials or even uh, Moroccans they considered collaborators, and this was. Uh, really intensified in the early 50s, particularly during the exile of the king. Right. And then you mentioned that they were relocated to the south. So, but did the composition of the of the army remain the same? Did it change? Because we are, like, what I understand is that the struggle has shifted from anti-colonial to struggle for sovereignty. So the composition did change. Right. There were certain uh, members of the MLA who were um, uh, based in cities and were involved, uh, might call them sort of like urban, some of them were Republican, right, believing in uh, fighting for a kind of Republican future for Morocco. Um, others, I mean, there were volunteers, right, mm -hmm. anti-colonial um, volunteers. Uh, but I think the, the purpose of the, the MLA continues. I don't think it shifted from being anti-colonial. It still was anti-colonial, which was sort of what I was arguing um, in the brief history. Um, but when they moved south and set up headquarters in Gulmim, uh, so there was a kind of leadership, which I didn't get into in the paper itself, was complex. It was believed, uh, you know, Mehdi Bambarka was, was the Moroccan, uh, leader of the Moroccan left, the revolutionary, was in part trying to uh, create the MLA as a as a um, an armed counterweight, right, to the monarchy, because the Moroccan state this is processes of state formation in a sense, right, um, and this is partly why the, some of the leaders of the MLA were more socialist, leftist, and anti. Uh, uh, monarchical. Um, but in coming to Gulmim, right, first of all, there was a campaign through the south of sort of taking care of French collaborators on the way. And then they established these headquarters, and that's where the composition really changes, uh, and the, the um, combatants involve a great deal of people yeah. from across the Sahara. Mm -hmm. So my next question yeah. is, uh, like, I can't help uh, see the parallel between the division of the Levant you know, the drawing of the borders and bring it to the current, the not current luckily, but to the few years back with ISIS that claimed they were fighting in an area that was artificially divided. And in your case, what I understand, I'm surprised about who drew that border. Like, I bet the tribes who lived in that region did not, I mean, these borders were new for them or was there anything was there was there any uh, base for these lines that you that can uh, that constitute what is uh, this is what's curious is that the, particularly the Moroccan Algerian border um, up until the the I believe early fifties um, was administered uh, not as a border but as a border region les confins algérien there was a there was like a colonial agency. Um, that sought specifically to avoid defining a border. Morocco is protected, Algeria is under the Ministry of the Interior. So it, it was not even defined um, until the 50s. And this is where, uh, I didn't get into detail, but this is where the actions of the MLA in, in, in fact coincided with and I think in part contributed to the sort of drawing of the line. Oh. 
so their activities contributed to the drawing the line. Although you, although they were fighting, like they were having anti-colonial struggle, which basically denies or does not acknowledge those lines. How interesting. So they did not achieve their goals. No, <laughs> uh, it seems that uh, it's counterproductive. But there's all these, there's, um, there's a whole sort of, um, you know, regiment uh, based in either French West Africa, which Mortini was a part of, that was meant to sort of facilitate, um, uh, you know, semi-pastoral nomads to, to, to have a kind of cart identity cart system to move around the area without uh, having hard customs or borders. So it was very, the, 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 the borders were very undefined um, in this area where they're, they're, that have, where the conflict has, has been centered for decades. And how is it now? Okay, like recently. Well, I mean, Morocco has a has a thousand kilometer berm uh, full of mines and uh, armed, you know, soldiers to the hilt. There's eight walls, you know, with anti tank mines, anti personnel mines. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, but that too doesn't follow any of the geopolitical boundary. Yeah, it's 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 within the the. It's a little west of. The borders of Western Sahara, yeah. which is tactical, I think. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, this is going to be beyond what the talk here, and I don't mean to interfere, <laughs> but it's going that means all the social and cultural bonds and ties and the social life, because these areas, I assume, are not empty. There are people who live there, and that means they are like there is. Social ramification for that. Yeah, usually. I mean, well, I think one way to think of the first period of war from uh, 75 to 91 officially is in, is, I don't want to say, you know, absolute terms, but possibly unprecedented period of immobility in a region, you know, defined by structural displacement, right? Because cities were actually fenced in, you know. Uh, there was, a, there was conflict throughout the, the desert, the D of the countryside. And so people were, conf and then refugees were in the camps. And this was, uh, this was a kind of immobility that was quite, I think, unusual. Can I ask one more question? Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. No, <laughs> no, okay. Um, I'm thinking about just the way you're conceptualizing like ongoing decolonization or being stranded. And um, there was another concept you used, and I would like for practically close, but not. And I'm wondering, do you see parallels with other contexts? And of course, the context I think about is Palestine. And yeah. Yeah. That was, yeah. That was a good question, too. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts as well. Well, we'll address next, next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. There yeah. are many parallels. Yeah. When we talk about settlement, when we talk about occupation, uh, about the diplomatic favor of the UN, uh, there are many parallel, parallel with, with Palestine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I think what it's interesting, any comparison is interesting for the basis of comparison for also then what it shows in terms of difference, which is um, part of the constant mobilization in terms of nonviolent activism specifically is the search for audience, right? An act of violence doesn't necessarily seek an audience, it seeks yeah. right, the, the, the effects of violence per se, let's say. Whereas uh, human rights activism, in, in a sense, you could argue, you know, needs an audience. And this is the huge difference between Western Sahara and, and mm -hmm. Palestine. Um, mm -hmm. Spain is very much implicated because there's a tremendous large Sahrawi diaspora and a civil society that is tremendously sympathetic to the cause. And so it's, it's, there's that, we could say, you know, audience. Um, a great deal of Mauritanian, the number of Mauritanians are, you know, have kinship ties and, and affiliations. But there, the I think the mobile the part of why I was interested by the you know constant mobilization is that it was driven in part by the needing seeking attention. Yeah. Um, and other scholars of Western Sahara have written about this, uh, you know, the kind of um, also the activism in the camps and the way the sort of discourse of um, activists in the camps towards uh, visitors. Yeah. 
So if I go back to the issue of, uh, of identity, um, my question, how has identity, this overlap identity been articulated? Um, if we take into consideration this artificial territorial discontinuity, the territory under occupation, then you have a liberated territory managed and administered by the Polisario, and you have an exiled community. We talk about the refugees and Tanduf camps. And uh, in Tanduf, there's this Polisario's uh, egalitarian ide ideology um, around uh, self organizing, um, the idea of uh, self administration, um, and uh, the role of women, of course, uh, as, as, as strong, she has a strong role in the movement, uh, even before uh, the inception of, of the Polisario in 1975, 76. Um, here, I think there are those three levels, at least uh, in an arbitrary way, I say, of, of identity. This identity formed within the camps, uh, there is another identity uh, might be called the kind of indigenous identity where uh, people under occupation, they want uh, to separate from Moroccans or at least from the settlers and um, assert their own identity. And there is another identity of those coming from Morocco, uh, moving from Morocco uh, during the occupation. Um, and, and living in Western Sahara. So how this overlapping identity is um, uh, articulated in, in Western Sahara, and especially as, a, as I pointed out, this kind of superficial discontinuity between, especially that is a territory under occupation and another one uh, considered liberated and, uh, and administered by, by the Polisario. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly complex. And I think um, there's, there's separation, which produces a, a certain fragmentation in families that have been separated for generations at this point. Mm -hmm. But I also think uh, ethnographically move around what you see is there's also a great deal of mobility and, and, and connectivity. Mm -hmm. Scholars of the Sahara write about but it's region defined by connectivity, almost predicated on it. We think of long distance trading. So, um, uh, you know, some refugees, so two points I'm trying to make quick, right? Some people uh, live on opposite sides and they lived in northern Mauritania. Uh, some people keep property in Mauritania. Um, uh, these returnees, right, they move between uh, without necessarily changing their allegiance. So there are forms of mobility. Um, I think it's also, we could talk about identity, but we can also maybe talk about different subject positions that are produced by uh, this political project. So refugee, for example, is a, a subject position with very, um, you know, I don't wanna say unique, but particular meanings for those in the camps, which is both to be a refugee is also to be a citizen, to have a home in displacement. And the camps, if we look in a kind of formal sense, are almost, the most one of the most stable political forms in their region. I don't want to say that in a, to assume that the you know it's the, where they want to be, but it's 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 a stable form of uh, right political form. It's been there for decades. So refugee is a subject position. Um, this the subject position of the returnee is another one. Um, so I think we can also talk about different kinds of subject positions. The, the former member of the Liberation Army is another one that then ask uh, its men, it, those in that position to certain, sometimes perform certain, in certain ways, take on certain identities. Um, Thank you. Well, um, I, I, I'm afraid that we are running out of time and uh, um, please uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Brewery for his excellent